Okay, now it should be working. Okay, should we start admitting people now? I'll admit everyone. Hey Nina, good to Hi, see you. <laughs> good seeing you. Yeah, I see many wise people here. <laughs> I uh, just wanted to say hi and then listen to your talk. Good to see you. It's been a while. Okay, so uh, thanks everyone for coming. So we can start. Uh, thank you for joining this session of the virtual seminars in economic theory. Uh, Nina Bokova from RISE is going to present information choice in auctions. Uh, we thank our guest panelists, Angel Hernando Vesiana and Xiang Wen Si. Uh, who are participating. Uh, the format of these seminars is as follows. We have a 60-minute presentation with time for interim questions from the panelists. However, if you also want to ask a question that you find relevant, you can also do it as well. Uh, Nina is, is not going to monitor the chat, uh, but you can also put a, a question in the chat that you, uh, she can um, see at the end of the talk. Um, at the end of the talk, there's going to be an extra opportunity to ask questions live in the Q&A session. Uh, the talk is recorded. Um, it is also broadcasted in YouTube and in the virtual chair, Academic Metaverse. The link will be provided uh, in the Zoom chat in a few moments. After the Q&A session, we will switch to the virtual chair for a few minutes to chat uh, informally. And uh, we will meet in the seminar room. Uh, before I hand over to uh, Nina, let me invite you to our seminar next week. Federico Esenike from Caltech is going to talk about screening uh, p-hackers dissemination noise as bait with Kevin He. And the guest panelists are Marco Taviani and Peter Sorensen. As usual, uh, you can find more information on our website or by following us on Twitter. Uh, thank you, Nina. The mic is yours. Wonderful. Um, one second. Thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, present this brand new version, actually, of this paper. Thank you, everybody, for being here. So let me dive right in. Think about selling an object in an auction. In many environments, bidders might not perfectly know how much they like the object for sale. But what bidders can do is they can learn. And you might think about this learning having basically two dimensions to it. You might think about, well, how much information should bidders learn? But there is potentially also the question about which aspect, about which attribute of the object per sale bidders can learn. And this is going to be the focus of my talk today, on which aspect of the object for sale bidders are going to learn before the auction takes place. In particular, I'm going to assume that there is some commonality of the object for sale, some common aspect, something that every bidder cares equally about. And I'm going to call this the common component. And in addition, every bidder is going to have something that matters for her individually. And I'm going to call this the private component, like a match-specific realization for the object. And I'm in particular interested about what if bidders cannot learn everything there is? What if my bidders have somehow to make up a choice? Would they rather focus their attention on the private component or on the common component or in some convex combination of the two that I'm going to be specific later on? Okay. To set some intuition, think about an oil field um, being um, sold off. Okay, So just an, uh, the auction for an oil track. And there's a certain amount of oil on site. No matter who gets access to the oil field will get access to the same volume of oil to the same market price for oil. That would be the common component. But bidders might be different with respect to their drilling technology, with respect to how far away their infrastructure is and things like this. This could be the private component. So what if at the margin they cannot learn about both and they have to make up their mind, perform one exploratory drilling, figure out how much oil there is, learn about the common component, or rather take a soil prop and figure out how well their particular, let's say, drilling technology fits the situation at hand. Okay. Another example could be the takeover auction for a company. Irrespective of who gets the company, will get the standalone value of the company. 
for example, all the assets, the liquidity. This is a common component. But our bidders might be different with respect to their overlap, for example, in research and development. What well, some kind of synergy effects with the with the uh, with the object? Okay, so what if bidders cannot learn everything there is? What if bidders cannot learn about the common component and the private component, but somehow have to make up their mind? What would they rather focus on, the common or the private component? Okay. And for most of today, I think for like 40 minutes of today, I'm going to focus on this either or decision, learning about a common or a private component, which might make sense in environments in which, for example, for exploratory drilling, drilling half a hole or performing only half the experimental steps is not going to produce useful information. And then towards the end, we are going to wrap up and figure out how this works in the more complex learning environment in which you can get a signal that is informative about two things. Now you probably already get the feeling that um, whether you learn about one or the other, the common or the private component, how valuable, how valuable this is for you as a bidder is going to depend on what the other bidders are going to learn about and potentially also on the chosen auction format. All right. So if my opponent and I, if we both drill for oil, if we both learn about the common component, we are basically analyzing the same underlying fundamental. So we are likely to receive correlated signals. On the other hand, if the other bidder and I, if we learn more about independent, um, about our private components, we're going to get independent signals. So the degree of correlation in our private information is going to be endogenously determined here and depend on what bidders decide to learn about. And similarly, the extent of the winner's curse is going to depend on what bidders decide to learn about. If the other bidder did not drill for oil, but learned about something that is completely irrelevant for me, then the fact that I won against him bears no information for me, right? I'm not, this is not bad news about how much oil there is. On the other hand, if the opponent drilled for how much oil there is and I won the auction, well, this might be bad news about how much oil there is. So the degree of the winner's course, whether it's an issue here or not at all, is going to be endogenously determined. So think about this from the perspective of efficiency. If we are interested in the object going to the person who values it the most, who is that? That's the person with the highest private component. So from the perspective of efficiency, bidders should not be wasting their resources learning about the common component that does not matter for the efficient allocation decision, and rather focus their attention on learning about their private components to figure out who has the highest one, given the information that they have. From the perspective of the bidders, it's not clear that this is what they want to do. Learning about the common component, if the other does so as well, gives me potentially correlated information with the other person. I have a better understanding how the other person is going to bid and potentially choose the degree of the winner's curse that I think is most profitable to me in this environment. All right. So there is a possible tension here between efficiency, requiring learning about the private component, and individual incentives that are not clear extent in which direction they're going to go. Okay. And we're interested in how this trade off, how this tension is resolved. Let me give you a preview of the results that, I'm, that I hope to show you with the time that I have. First set of results are going to be of an absolute nature. We're going to focus on a simple case of two bidders who are choosing between learning about the common private component and both signals, both this information is going to be equally informative for them about their value. Let me be a bit vague here. What I mean is that if I were just to offer a posted price to a bidder, my bidder should be indifferent between learning about the common or the private. So this is what I mean by equally informative. I'll be more specific later on. In this environment, I'm going to show you that the second price auction is the ex ante efficient auction format. It's going to induce learning only about the private component in any symmetric equilibrium. And we are going to end up with bidders having independent private values endogenously as a function of what they decide to learn about. Okay, so this is the first set of results that I'm going to show you with a couple of extensions to more than two bidders and potentially breaking this equal informative um, assumption. The second set of results that I might have less time for today is a set of results in relative terms. 
I'm going to compare whether the second price auction, how it does with respect to learning about common and private in comparison to another auction format, namely the first price auction. And I hope to show you that the, in the first price auction, they are higher incentives to learn about the common component than in the second price auction. And that the reverse is true for learning about the private component. Okay. Nina, can I ask a clarification question? So mm -hmm. the extent efficiency here is, uh, uh, I guess, uh, including both uh, informational efficiency and allocation efficiency, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So I must, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, this is, I hope it will become later more clear in the model, how we are thinking about these two concepts. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, in terms of technique, we are going to apply a notion of informativeness from Lehman accuracy and figure out how well it does in this multidimensional framework where we have two components and we are learning about the value in total. And there is going to be a very useful lemma on the way establishing uh, basically a first order stochastic dominance between second order statistic of bits in the environment in which we are in. All right. If there are no further questions about the motivation, let me then get into the model. All right. So sorry, can I ask you a question uh, on your clarification question? Why, uh, why cannot you choose, um, um, I mean, something in between uh, that is uh, you, you are, you are, you are facing a, an either or decision, you only choose um, or learning uh, one component or the other. Why cannot you choose uh, um, something in between? Is it uh, because you want to make the model more tractable or something like that or why? Thank you. For, uh, that's an excellent question. Right now, I'm showing you a simple benchmark case that I think has some pedagogical value to it. And depending on how much time we have later, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to allow people later on to learn about any convex combination they want about the common and private component. But I'm going to keep this equal informativeness assumption. And I'm sorry for the hand waving because I, I did not show you the definition yet. That's going to be our first generalization. And in the last 20 minutes, I'm going to show you a much more general model in which you get a signal that contains information about two things. And you have to decide how much of this is going to be about the common and how much do you pay to learn about the private component. But for now, this is our simple benchmark because there is some clean intuition here that I want to carry across before I generalize this. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Perfect. So we have one object for sale in the auction. There is no reserve price. We are looking at the special case of two bidders. There is a common component. I'm denoting it by us. It has, um, and there's a private component TI, okay, with support T. My private components are drawn identically and all the components are drawn independently from each other. The valuation of bidder I is some function that depends on the common component, the private component, for now, separately edited, monotone, uh, so sorry, every component, uh, the value increases in every component, and it's non-negative, so that our statements here about efficiency make sense. Okay. This is, um, uh, these are the players and their payoffs. Let's go to information. For now. One question, I mean, just it's just a curiosity, why you have the function U and the function W rather than just, you know, denoting S and TI? Yes, um, I was thinking about this. Uh, the only thing that matters for me is that the value is non-negative and increasing in the components. So I could have just relabeled this exactly until as you're suggesting, and it would not make a difference. For now, I'm keeping the fact that it's additively separable, right? So this is the important important assumption here. But you're right, I could have renamed the components and gotten basically the same for the renamed components. There is no real generality here. Thank you. Okay, information. All the components are unknown to everybody involved. Each bidder chooses one experiment. A bidder can learn about the common experiment or a bidder can, learn, sorry, can see the common component experiment or a bidder can see the private component experiment. This is our either or assumption for now. And I'm denoting the experiment always with a superscript for the component that it is about. So S for the common component experiments and XI superscript T for the private component experiment. All right, um, this is not an exercise in information design. 
the PDFs of my two signals are given. My bidders choose which of them to observe, not the precise shape of it. Okay. And the information choice that the bidder faces is simply which of them to observe that I'm capturing with sigma. So sigma is the probability of learning the common component experiment. Okay, that's my choice for now. So, I mean, another clarification. So basically you are assuming here that the information uh, about the common component is conditionally independent? Yes, exactly. Um, next okay. slide, perfectly. You're ahead of me. Ah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I One. see. Wonderful. Okay, so I there see. are a couple of, mm -hmm. so I think uh, you're asking this to tame this kind of general correlation structures that could live in the space, right? So let me, let me do this okay. now. Unless both bidders learn about the common component, their signals are independent. If two bidders learn about the common component, their signals are conditionally independent on us. Final I mean, uh, I mean mm -hmm. I, yeah, my question was basically the, I mean, of course, I mean, this is a very meaningful assumption, but uh, to some extent, I mean, uh, this basically makes less interesting to acquire information about the common component if the other agent is already acquiring information about the common component, which is not a general, the general case. I mean, in principle, more information about something could be useful, more useful if we have already some information about this other thing. So there may be complementarities, whereas here you're looking at the substitutable case, which, you know, is a restriction. I mean, a meaningful restriction, but it's a restriction. Let me see whether I understand you correctly. So we do have correlation here, right? If the other person drills for oil, I'm going to end up with correlated signals. The reason for assuming this assumption is that I would not be sure how to tame the general correlation structures, positive negative correlation on the same thing without it. So, but I, I'll, be, I'll be happy to hear whether you have a particular suggestion, but I want people to be correlated if they learn about the same thing. But of course, the, the, this assumption is not without loss and I'm, I'm, I'm doing this for tractability in a way. And I do have correlation, so just... Uh -huh. Sorry, uh, may I ask one more question about the previous slide? Like, what is mm -hmm. sigma? Sigma, oh, so that's just a mixed strategy. If sigma is equal to one, you learn the common component experiment. If sigma is equal to zero, you learn the private component experiment, and you can mix. And if sigma is one, then I uh, precisely know the private component, right? Uh, it's noisy, though. So you have a dense uh, like a PDF here based on the realization of the common component. So signals uh, are not perfectly revealing. There is noise. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, yeah, I'm assuming in addition the monotone likelihood ratio property saying that high states go together with high signals, low states go together with low signals. All right. Um, I think coming back a little bit to Constantine questions from just now, what kind of value frameworks can I nest in this environment? If both bidders learn about the private component only, we're in an independent private value case. Of course, there's a common component out there, but nobody knows anything about it. It's just a normalization. And if both bidders decide to drill for oil, learn about the common component, I'm in a pure common value environment. Now, let me briefly go over the timing. The auction format is announced, so all the components are drawn. Then bidders, and that's important, covertly select what to learn about. Observe their realization of the experiment and decide how to bid before knowing what, how the other person, what the other person learned or how they bid. So information choice is happening here after the announcement of the mechanism. That's what I'm after. Fix an auction format like second price or first price. What are bidders learning about based on that? And the second part is that information choice is covered. So if a bidder deviates from a candidate equilibrium of learning one thing, the others will not know. This is a crucial difference. And I'm considering the set of symmetric monotonic based Nash equilibria in which I want the bidders to choose uh, with the same probability to observe the common component experiment and have potentially two bidding functions based on what they decide, uh, based on the observation of the experiment that they saw. Uh, sorry, and why two bidding functions and not one bidding function that depends on two parameters? What could have done that? So I just want to give my people the flexibility to be differently, but I need to give them the flexibility because a signal 0.5 about the common component will not mean the same as 0.5 about the other. It's, um, 
Okay. okay, so the mixed strategy means that still I'm either learning this thing, but not uh, the other thing, right? I cannot get two signals. Not yet. So sorry, you will never get two signals. But right now, your signal is only going to be informative either about the common or the private component, and you're precisely going to know which one of it is. Thank you. For the interest of time, let me very briefly go over the related literature. Because of this interdependency here, I'm drawing on the seminal work from Milgram and Weber and Susan Effie. The notion of accuracy of informativeness, I'm going to be using the one from Lehman. There's a lot, like a long literature of papers looking at information acquisition in auctions in covered or with overt information acquisition. And actually my two panelists have several works in this environment. For example, the paper by Xian Wen with uh, Bergemann and Velimaki or Anhel's paper in 2009. And um, the closest paper there to mine is the paper from Persico from 2000. And I'm going to be hopefully have the time to come back to this later on. Um, yes, let me just move on to my benchmark case. I mentioned in the beginning, for now, I want to fix informativeness between the two components. What do I mean by this? I want a bidder who is facing, for example, a posted price to be completely indifferent between learning the common or the private component signal. So if their payoff depends exclusively on the expected value of the object, they should be indifferent. I'm doing this to tease out the strategic effect of learning about the common or the private component. And in order to do this, I'm assuming the following. So I'm going to first assume that the experiment, the common component experiment and the private component experiment have the same distribution of the expected value. And this is my notation. I hope you do see my mouse. This is the notation that I'm going to use for this. If, although that might take some relabeling to achieve this, both experiments, the common and the private one, have the same marginal distribution of the signal. And based on any signal realization, my expected value is going to be the same, okay? So this is a way possibly after relabeling to make sure that the, the random variable that is the expected value based on learning is the same between the private and the common component signal. This is going to give me a result that only depends on the strategic interaction, not on choosing the signal just because it's so much more informative than the other. Okay. With this assumption, um, I wanted to show you briefly two cases when it is satisfied. The easiest case is if everything is symmetric, if all the components are distributed IID, if my value function is a symmetric function, and if my two experiments have quite literally the same PDF, this assumption from the slide before is going to be satisfied. It's not particularly exciting. Let me maybe show you a more interesting case. And the more interesting case is a more asymmetric case. Let's assume that the common component is either a zero or one with equal probability. And my private component is distributed uniformly on zero to 100. I have a value function that looks like this. Both my experiment, the common and the private component experiment are um, distributed with support on zero one. The private component experiment here is perfectly revealing, while the private, uh, the common component experiment has probably the world's most common uh, signal distribution that satisfies the monotone likelihood ratio property, just as an example, all right? So let's walk through only one particular signal realization. What happens if my common component signal is equal to zero? Okay, if the common component signal is equal to zero, we know the common component is zero. So the value depends only on the private component and is distributed between zero and 100. If the private component signal is zero, that means that the value is either zero or 100 with probability one half each. So it's not the same signal realization does not lead to the same distribution of the posterior. But in expectation, it does, because in both cases, the expected value is 50. And this is the generality that this notion is giving you. So this is as much room as I have with this assumption. Now, we know the assumption that I'm assuming. Now let's come to the result for the second price auction that I promised you. Here's the theorem. Let's assume that both signals satisfy my uh, basically uh, same expected value assumption that I have just shown you. In any symmetric equilibrium of the second price auction, bidders learn about the private component only. And such an equilibrium exists. That's good news for ex ante efficiency that Shen Wen asked about. Not only does the bidder with the highest signal win, but in this case, this is a spec. If they both learn about the private component, then the person with the highest 
signal is winning. So we are not wasting our learning resources on the common component. And I want to walk you with a bit of time that I have through the argument that is leading to this, because I think it's quite instructive. And let me focus on a very extreme case. Let me focus on the case where we start from a candidate equilibrium that is pure common values. We start from the case in which both bidders exclusively drill for oil and learn about the common component. What this is going to do is I'm going to show you that there exists a strictly profitable deviation for bidder one to instead of the common component, learn about her private component. So we have figured out the information choice in the deviation. And her bidding function is going to be the following for tractability. If she receives a signal X about the private component, I want her to bid as if she were receive, to receive the same signal about the common component. Yeah. So I'm going to split this argument now with this deviation strategy into what happens to the winning probability, what happens to the payment conditional and winning, what happens to the gain, and by this, show you how the uh, this is a strictly profitable deviation. Let's go over the uh, winning probability first, because this is the easiest. In the candidate equilibrium, everything is symmetric. We both drill for oil. We have both the same winning probability overall, one half. We are symmetric. No surprises here. In my deviation strategy, I'm now learning about something else, about the private component and using the same bidding function as if it was the common component. And you remember that by assumption, whether you learn about the common or the private component gives me the same marginal signal distribution. I'm applying the same bidding function to it. So I'm using, I am having the same marginal bidding function as before, just independent from the other person. What this gives me is that I still win if I have a higher signal than the other person, just about another component, and just now that they are in, uh, independent from each other. So my overall winning probability is still one half. So I've, uh, with this deviation for my beta one, we did not change her probability of winning. Let's go to the payment. In the candidate equilibrium, conditional on you winning, what do you pay? You pay the bit of the other person that is of course going to depend on her signal, here you have the CDF of the other person, conditional on you as bidder one, winning in the candidate equilibrium. It's basically the second order statistic of two correlated uh, random variables here, and correlated is where here it shows, where there is a common component that we are conditioning on. In the deviation strategy, this is how the distribution of the other person looks like, conditional on you winning, meaning that you have a signal about your private component now, all right? And if you look at this, this is just the second order statistic of two independent random variables. Okay? And if we compare the upper one to the lower one, we see that the one, uh, one dominates the other in a first order stochastic dominant sense. Let's look at how this looks like for the payment. This is for the candidate equilibrium. This is the PDF of um, the other person conditional on you winning against him. And this is for the deviation. The bidding function of the other person, that's what you end up paying in the second price option. So if you can choose between the distribution of the other bidder being first order stochastically dominant or dominated, which one would you pick? You would want to pick the one in which the bidder is as far away from you as possible. So um, with less correlation, you pay strictly less because the second order statistic of his bid is going to be lower. Let me take this argument to the extreme. Let's consider perfectly correlated bids with completely independent bids. Conditional on you winning with some bid, where do you want the other person to be? As far away from you as possible, right? In order to decrease the payment. Under perfect correlation, you're bidding exactly the same. Under independence, there's more of a gap between your own bid and the bid of the other person. So this is the driving force here, that conditional on winning with less correlation, you're going to bid, uh, to, sorry, you're going to pay strictly less conditional on winning. I have a plot here of the second order statistic uh, with the candidate equilibrium and the first order statistic uh, with the candidate equilibrium of two signals. And just to show you now these dotted or dashed lines, is what happens to these order statistics as we decrease correlation, right? 
there is more of a gap between the first and the second order statistic, it's more likely that the other person is bidding lower conditional on your winning. And this is driving this effect of um, strictly lower payment conditional on winning with the deviation. Now, let me show you what is going on with the expected gain conditional on winning. And let me try to do this without using a, form, a single formula. Let's see how far we get. Here, we have the expected gain conditional on winning in the candidate equilibrium. Nobody knows anything about their private component. So conditional on winning, your expected gain of the private component is simply your expected value. Everything is symmetric. So for any possible realization of the common component, everybody, my two bidders have the same probability of winning. We have covered the candidate equilibrium. Let's move to what happens with the deviation strategy. My deviating bidder looks at the private component, bids in an increasing fashion, the higher the signal, the higher she bids. So she's now more likely to win if her private component signal is high. So in comparison to the expected value in the candidate equilibrium, she's now her expected value of the private component is higher than before. She's acting up on this information about the private component. What about her um, expected gain in the deviation strategy from the common component? Let's first look at what goes on with the other person with the second bidder. The second bidder now is the only one who learns about the common component. She's going to win with a higher probability if the common component signal is high. So our second bidder's expected gain is higher as well with the deviation of the first bidder. Why by the same amount? Well, this is the driving assumption of our information about one or the other being equally informative, so bidder one with signal X and bidder two with signal X still win with the same probability. Last argument to wrap up the proof. We still don't know what about the expected utility of the first guy from the deviation. I just told you what happens with the second, but not the first who actually deviated. We are always selling the object with probability one. We are not burning the pie. We have the expected value of the common component to distribute. So if my second bidder gains that much and wins with probability one half, the first one has to be losing exactly the same amount. Because otherwise, we would be either creating or destroying the pie. We don't have slack here. So this is what the expected gain of the first person is going to look like from the common component. So what I just described to you is on the side of the winner's curse, my first bidder gained on the front of the private component, but lost on the front of the common component by the same amount. Overall, no effect. Let's gather these effects. Same expected gain, although now, of course, they're winning in different events. Now my deviating bidder is more likely to win when the private component is high and the common one is low. Strictly lower expected payment conditional on winning and same probability of winning. So we found ourselves a strictly profitable deviation. So uh, Nina, one question. So mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering from the very beginning about whether it is common value or it is correlation, what is driving the results. And it sounds to me that basically the fact that in the deviation you restrict to deviations in which the bit function doesn't change means that the common value is not important. And this last part that you explained even says that even common values do not create any creation of value, destruction of value. So it seems that common values is irrelevant. The only thing that matters is the correlation or independency of the information that it is being learned. Mm -hmm. I see what you're saying. So by design, I composed this deviation strategy to not mess around with the Venus curse and just exploit the Correl less correlation in payment without giving it much, like any role on the winner's curse side. Um, this is a deviation that worked. There could be another one that keeps the payment the same, but potentially does something with the with a winner's curse. Uh, I don't, ha I haven't looked or found them, uh, these kind of deviations. What you said about this correlation, this kind of argument, if the information about the common component would not be correlated, 
this kind of argument wouldn't work. I'm describing to you a way to decrease or increase payments via this shifting of the second order statistic, and that relies on having higher or lower correlation. Did I answer your question? I'm well, sure my, 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 question, my question was uh, uh, that it seems to me that if you have a model with no common values, so basically you have bidders with two potential signals they can learn, uh, both are private, I mean, they both refer to private values, okay? But one is independent of all the information of the other bidder, whereas the one, of, I mean, the second one is correlated with the private information of the, of the other bidder, okay, your argument works exactly the same. For the probability of winning expected payment, I absolutely agree. I would have very carefully to check what it means for the expected gain of the object. Because of course, yeah, I would, I would have to check, but you're completely right on the, on the first part of the argument. Thank you. But long story short, so uh, I think this is what Angel was also hinting at. As soon as there is any degree of correlation, it doesn't need, we don't need to be starting from pure common values. We could be starting from looking at the common component with some probability. The same argument works. If you can get rid of correlation via, via this trick without messing up your winner's curse, you will be strictly better off. This killed every possible symmetric equilibrium in which we just learn about the common component with some probability. Now, existence. And existence in this benchmark case is quite straightforward. Let's assume the other person learns about their private component. This is, for me, as bidder one, payoff irrelevant. There is no winner's curse. I have two signals to choose from. Both give me the same amount of information, and neither of them gives me any correlation with the other person. So I'm simply indifferent between the two. And this is what is giving me existence. All right. Now, um, coming back to partially to what I think Miguel was asking in the beginning, uh, beginning, what if experiments have information about two things at the same time? Let's go step by step. First, let's assume that there is this box of experiments that a bidder can choose from. And let's still keep this equal information overall assumption within this box for starters. So any two signals here are going to lead to the same distribution of the expected value as before, although they now can contain information about the common and the private component if you want. I still want to keep my uh, assumptions that I need for tractability, like conditional independence based on the common component, monotone likelihood ratio property, uh, full support, things like this. And I still need, not need, but want to have the private component experiment in there to give the bidders the choice to learn something that is going to be independent from everybody else, okay? So in this environment, long story short is that the result carries over. If my two bidders choose one experiment in the set, they are going to go in any symmetric monotonic equilibrium for the private component experiment. And we are once again going to have independent private values arising endogenously. And the argument is very similar to before uh, with using these, um, these deviation strategies to exploit the change on the first and second order statistics. All right. Um, let me now talk a little bit what happens if I break this assumption that both lead to the same distribution of the expected value. For this, I need the concept of higher accuracy. So let me quickly give a summary of what this concept is. We want to compare two signals in terms of how informative they are about the variable at hand that we're interested in. The notion that I'm going to use for this is the notion by Lehman that in statistical literature that you called effectiveness, but following Persico, it's more known as accuracy in the economics literature, and it does the following. Fix a random variable Z. That could be the value, the common, the private component, pick your favorite variable of interest. And we have two signals, XA and XB, that are affiliated with Z and have a CDF that is given here. We say that one signal is more accurate than another about Z. And this is the notation that I'm using for this, um, for this relation between the two, more accurate about Z. If for every possible signal realization, there is a function that basically maps the signal X through a transformation that I'm going to show you in one second on the figure. If this transformation is non-decreasing in Z, 
And I'm going to say that signals are equally accurate. And this here is going to be my notation for that. If this relation holds in both directions. Okay. Now let me show you how this um, transformation works and what it does before we start using it. Here I have just repeated the definition from the previous slide. I have plotted a less accurate signal on the left. I have plotted a more accurate signal on the right. And I'm assuming that we are learning about a variable Z that is binary for simplicity. Okay. Pick any signal you want, like signal X. If the state Z is zero, what signal on the more accurate experiment is going to give me the same CDF? That one right here. For Z equal to zero, here is going to be my CDF by assumption. We're not done yet. This is just one transformation of the signal. What if this Z is equal to one? What if my component increases? What is the signal that I would have to get under the more accurate signal to get the same CDF? Here, it maps into this. You see here how the mapping of the signal into the corresponding uh, signal on the more accurate signal is increasing in Z. And that's the requirement of higher accuracy. Okay? It means that the more accurate signal varies more strongly with Z. It's more likely to produce high signals when the state is high or low signal when the, when the state is low. Okay? So this was a quick recap of accuracy. This is a useful notion because it's more complete than black hole. We can compare more things. And it has been very successfully used in an auction environment. For example, by the paper from Persico that I was referring to earlier. Let me flag that usually people who use accuracy, um, they don't have to specify, like in my definition, um, let me not go, not go back, what the accuracy is about, because there's only one thing that bidders traditionally use, uh, learn about. Here, I'm carrying around this notation accuracy about what, because the signal can be uh, informative about the common, the private, the value. And in this environment, equal accuracy becomes actually a meaningful concept. It's not just the same experiment. For example, I could have a common and the private component signal have the same accuracy about the value, but one signal being more accuracy about the, uh, sorry, oh, the common component signal being more accurate about the common component than the private one and vice versa for the private. So equal accuracy has some bite here. And equal accuracy is also a stronger assumption than the one that I've showed you earlier about having the same distribution of the expected value. Okay, we know this notion. Given the time, let me skip over what it does because there is a big theorem from Lehman from which I only need one direction. Let's assume my decision maker chooses between a less or more accurate signal then she'll prefer the more accurate one if her payoff satisfies a single crossing property that I have not shown you, but you'll have to take my word for that I'm taking care of establishing these whenever I need to. Okay, now we know what accuracy does. Let's bring this to this environment and figure out how we can use it. So far, we worked with a knife edge case of basically a bit of being indifferent between learning about one or the other in a single decision maker framework for example, for a posted price. What if I can't compare them in this term? What if my two experiments do not satisfy this assumption? How can I extend what I have taught you so far? The way to do this is to find an auxiliary signal, x tilde t, that is less accurate about the private component, and to establish the point of reference between two signals about different things, I can just use my previous results. So if this auxiliary signal and the signal about the common component, if they lead to the same distribution of the expected value and my auxiliary signal is less accurate than the one that I actually have the choice with, then the previous results carry over in the following sense. In this environment, when we have this auxiliary experiment satisfying being less accurate about the private component and this point of reference, Bidders learn about the private component in any symmetric equilibrium. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Nina, one, one question out of curiosity. I mean, I, I kind of imagine the answer, but I guess that this inequality or this equation that you have on the slide at the moment doesn't imply that X tilde Ti is uh, more accurately informative no, about the common value component. No? Oh. So, 
if yes, this one exactly. component has no information about the common component, it's only informative about the private component. So I have my two components and I, I, I need to find an auxiliary signal that also lives on the private component that also contains information about the private component and none about the common component. Uh, I'm not about the com oh, I see, I see, I misunderstood. Okay, I see. So this is a signal that is less informative about the private value component, but uh, I, I mean, I don't see anything about the common value component. That's that's where I was wondering. No, no, no. So yeah, exactly. This this assumption lives right here. If so, if a bidder would have a posted price setup, she would be different between my auxiliary signal and the common signal. This auxiliary experiment has no information about the common component at all. But to establish a point of reference, I'm assuming here's the assumption from previously okay, that it gives the same expected value distribution um, as the common component signal. Here is the what I meant with the point of reference. Otherwise, you would not be able to compare it at all. I see. Okay. I see. And this is important that I'm comparing things here in terms of components, not in terms of uh, the value overall. So let me skip why this is the case and instead describe to you why. I've done it that way with an auxiliary signal. You might have thought, why even bother with this auxiliary signal? Why not plainly assume that my private component signal is more accurate about the value instead of a component than my common component signal, right? So this might be at least, this is a conjecture that I had in the beginning. Turns out this notion, talking about accuracy about the value is really not very useful in this environment. And let me give you two reasons why that is the case. The first one is that we compare, we can compare only very few things in terms of this accuracy notion. It might not seem like this, but the problem that we keep running into is just because a signal is more accurate about the private component does not mean that it's more accurate about the value overall. It will very crucially depend on what kind of value function you have in the background. So there's potentially very little up to an empty set that we can compare. The second reason is that we cannot conclude that even if we find signals that we can rank in terms of accuracy about the value, even then we cannot say that the bidder prefers one to the other. The problem here being that let's assume the value is equal to one. Is it equal to one because the common component is high or because the private component is, equal to, uh, is, is high? One or the other gives you different information about the other person. So you can't get rid of the signal being directly payoff relevant here. Now I'm running short on time, but I had a beautiful example where you start from a completely noisy signal about the common component and nothing is more accurate about the value than pure noise. So this is in my paper, but let me skip this because I'm running short on time. But these are the two reasons why you do not want to work directly with accuracy on value, the sum or some kind of function of the two components, but rather compare them in terms of accuracy about the individual components. Okay. Now with the remaining 15 minutes, I think that I have or a little bit less, let me go to the general setup that I promised you in the beginning and more of the general results. Um, so you might think everything I've done so far is basically figure out how far can I stretch this assumption uh, not assumption, but result of this IPV, independent private values, arising endogenously in the second price auction. Okay? So is this a micro foundation for independent private values, what I'm trying to say here? The answer is a cautious yes, if the costs of learning indeed um, depend only on the distribution of the expected value of the I. But the answer is no in many other cases. If there is any kind of inada condition, in a sense that learning marginally more about the common component is arbitrarily cheap, we will never end up with IPV, just by design. If two components are just simply easier to learn about, then this assumption on the same cost might also not be reasonable. And finally, plainly, an experiment that is exclusively informative about the private component might simply not be available. If that's the case, what can I say? Can I at least compare then the second price auction with the first price auction in terms of which one leads to more learning about the private or the common component? Yeah. And the answer is yes, um, I can. And let me show you how. And the setup is going to be considerably more general than before. More than two bidders, if you like, uh, still risk neutral, all the components as before. 
my evaluation now can be any increasing function that is continuously differentiable of the two. I no longer need additively separability. Okay. Information. Bidders are still going to observe a one-dimensional signal. One-dimensional is important for me. But this one-dimensional signal can contain information about two things at the same time, about the common and the private component. And this is going to be parameterized by two variables, sigma and tau. A higher sigma given tau means more accurate about the common component. A higher tau given sigma means more accurate about the private component. This learning, choosing sigma and tau, comes at the cost, monetary costs of learning, which is captured here by the cost function that depends on sigma and tau. And the agents, the bidders, are choosing sigma and tau. All experiments are still have to satisfy certain assumptions. For example, they need to be differentiable in sigma tau. They have to be independent given the common component, maximum likelihood ratio property, full support. And I just normalize them on zero, one. OK, so this is the general information setup. This is as much as I'm specifying. Let's talk about the expected payoff of an agent in the second or the first price auction. Fix what every other bidder is learning about. Let's assume that everybody else is choosing sigma and tau. Assume that everybody else is choosing the same symmetric monotonic bidding strategy that I'm denoting here with their information choice. A is a placeholder for the auction that we are running for the first or the second price auction. Here is the expected payoff in mechanism A when my bidder is placing bid B. For the first price auction, given the common, the private component, and the bid, this is what you get, the value of the object. This is your bid. You pay it if you win. What's your probability of winning? This is given by this object right here. This is basically the first order statistic of everybody else. Up to which signal? Well, we need to use the inverse bidding function to figure out with your bid against whom do you win? Uh, sorry, against whom do you win? And this depends only on the common component, right? There is no private component in here because the private component that you have is independent from what everybody else knows. For the second price auction. So, uh, Nina, so, sorry, mm -hmm. I, I got lost at this point. So, uh, uh, are you assuming now that uh, uh, the the each of the bidders observes a unidimensional signal? Yes. Yes. And exactly. Then what does it mean, ST? What does it mean, ST? Because uh, so this is this is they take expectations with respect to this utility function, or how do you how should oh, I oh, think oh, about sorry. this utility mm -hmm. function? Mm -hmm. So you do not know S, you do not know T. You are going oh, to, to make expectations based okay, on your fine. information. Sure. So this is just you expect to pay off if this would be the case. Of course, you do not know, and you have to make this inference to, uh, on your signal realization. Absolutely. I'm trying to connect this to our classical decision theory framework in which we have a payoff, fix a component, fix a bid. What's your payoff? You don't know the component, but you can learn about it. Here, I'm trying to say that I have a mirror, Im not mirror image, but a related problem in two dimensions based on the common and the private component. OK, just quickly for the second price auction, this expression looks very, very similar, with the exception that you are now not paying your own bid, but you're paying the bid of uh, the other person conditional on winning against him, right? And here is against which types you, you win in the second price auction. All this is fairly standard with the exception that I'm carrying around here two components. What this is going to be useful, and I think this is as far as I can get today, is the following observation. In equilibrium, if you bid exactly as the candidate equilibrium prescribes you to bid, you win if you have a higher signal than everybody else, right? So let's look at the payoff difference of the second and the first price auction. How does the value of the object vary between the two? Well, it does not. The only variance between the two in equilibrium is going to be coming through the payment, not through the expected gain. In both auctions, in a candidate equilibrium, 
the value of the object will be the same for you. So they only vary in the payment, meaning that the difference between first and second price auctions uh, expected payoff is going to be constant in the private component. Okay? This will not hold off equilibrium. This will not hold in any asymmetric equilibrium, but this is the, uh, the beauty of looking at evaluating learning at the candidate equilibrium. So the difference between first and second price auction is going to be driven by the common component, which determines the joint correlation, so, not the so, private uh, component. Again, another clarification, but mm -hmm. uh, I understand this result for additive separable uh, private values and common values I, I get lost uh, when they are not additively separable. Mm -hmm. um, look at this ex expression right here. I hope you do see my mouse. My computer seems yes. to be slowing down. The, I did not assume additive separability here. And if you plug in for the bid, your equilibrium behavior, you're going to be winning if your signal is higher than the others. Right? So your winning probability is going to be the same in the first and the second price auction. Okay, And the difference in those two expressions, it will just be the value of the object given S given T, which is, I mean, the same, and the same winning probability. What remains? Only the payment part. But the payment part depends only on the common component, not the private one. I'm not saying the private component does not matter. I say that if we are looking fix S, fix T, and assume that you bid like you're supposed to in the candidate equilibrium, the difference in payoffs is going to be driven by the payment, not the value of the object. But that is pinned down by the common component, not by the private one. Okay, um, let me show you with one slide where I want to head to, and I have like five minutes, right? If I understand this correctly. Okay. So we fixed everything else about the prior, uh, what the others are learning. We fixed their strategies. Here is what's your expected payoff. If you choose the purple information, everybody else behaves like they're supposed to in a candidate equilibrium. And purple is your choice here, how much to learn about the common or the private component. We have here the cost, and I'm assuming already that you're bidding optimally for your information. The reason I'm showing you that is that I can define what I'm actually interested in, namely, what's your marginal revenue from learning a bit more about the common or a bit more about the private component in equilibrium. These are these marginal expressions right here. Here, I'm denoting MR tau for the private component. This is your marginal revenue. If you learn a tad more about the private component, evaluate it at the candidate equilibrium. And this is the same expression for the common component. How much do you gain from learning a little bit more about the common component? Evaluate it in the candidate equilibrium. So this, these two expressions are everything that I needed to define in order to show you the actual results that I have. And um, here is the first one from le for learning about the common component. Fix any information choice here, any tau about the private component. Learning marginally more about the common component is more valuable in the first price than in the second price option. I do not have time to go into the details of how I prove this, but let me say that this generalizes a proof technique in Persico. The problem that I'm having is that now I have this private component floating around and learning more about the common component. I did not, if you remember, I did not specify what this does to learning about the private component. Maybe if I increase sigma, I now can learn much, much less about my private component, right? So there is this indeterminacy here. But it turns out that I can generalize using this argument from the last slide about the private component basically being irrelevant for the payment in equilibrium, a payment difference. In equi uh, sorry, the private component being irrelevant for the difference in the uh, value of the object, but not the payment, and get this result. All right, because evaluated at the equilibrium, it's only the payment that matters. And Persico has this uh, paper with this argument that in the first price auction, it basically hurts you more to bid further away from the other person. There's this old idea of leaving money on the table. Well, in the second price auction, if you bid a little bit further away, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, but it doesn't matter much 
in a way, depending on where the other person is. So this all generalizes to the two dimensional framework without specifying what learning more about the common component does to your inference about the private one. This is the result for the common component. Let me show you the result for the learning about the private component. Like I just mentioned, uh, if you learn more about the private component, what happens to your inference about the common component? It might be that it stays the same. It might be that because you learn so much more about the private component, you're losing accuracy on the common component side. Depending on the result, I'm going to give you uh, this, uh, the, the result for this based on the assumption. Let's assume that if we learn a bit more about the private uh, private component, not a bit more, if you learn about the private component, we are not changing anything about the inference about the common one. You basically keep it fixed. Then learning about the second, uh, learning about more about the private component gives me the same marginal revenue in the second price and first price option. And if I have to give up information about the common component to learn more, we can use our previous result that show that this learning more about the private component is more valuable in the second price than the first price option. Just in terms of the first results, um, it has been long known since the 90s, I think since the paper from Hausch and Lee, that in an independent private value setup, first price and second price option are giving the same incentives to learn about the private component. Turns out this carries over to this more general framework with correlation, as long as you're not varying the joint correlation of the signals. But if you have to basically give up information about the common component, bad news in the first price auction, we are learning more about the other person in a way helps you out more. I'm sorry for having to hand wave to this argument. Let me just wrap up because I think I'm at the end of time and just summarize what I've done. The question here at the front was what to learn about, which component, and not how much about a given box in a way. And um, for the second price auction, once I assumed that both the common and private component give the same amount of information overall, I've shown you that we get independent private value endogenously in the second price auction. And I've also uh, hinted at the, the relative model in the end that I have, where in terms a relative terms, I can compare the incentives of the second and first price auction to learn about common versus private um, components. And the result of Persico and uh, a couple of others are generalizable in this uh, two-dimensional world. Let me add and end maybe on a more general point. I think that the question of information choice about attributes or component, it's an interesting one. And it's one that did not deserve a lot of attention yet. As soon as you have any environment, any strategic environment in which some aspects matter to some people, but not others and vice versa, you, this question of efficiency arises. And based on which institutional mechanism you pick, people might be drawn to learning about one or another. And as a consequence of this, you can ask questions of the optimal design of an institution like, or how different institutions like first and second price give different rise to different incentives to learn about one or the other. So I think there are many inter more interesting uh, areas here, and I've actually worked on a couple of them myself, so I'll be very happy to, uh, to talk more about that. Sorry for going over time, and thank you all for the questions and for being here. Thank you very much, Nina. It was a very nice presentation. Uh, I will first ask uh, our panelists uh, uh, if they have any comments. So first, uh, Xiang Wen, do you have any comments, questions? Yeah, okay. So uh, this is a very nice paper, and uh, the result is... I. Uh, in my view, it's very surprising that uh, IPV framework can arise endogenously in a kind of a, the, a model framework with uh, both private values and common values. So I have a couple of questions. So the, and maybe uh, also a comment. Um, let me first uh, make a comment about uh, this um, uh, result that uh, uh, IPV uh, may arise endogenously in the, in the, in, frame, in the framework with uh, interdependent values. So there's uh, like uh, in pre auction literature, they try to test, for example, whether uh, the environment has a, has a common value environment or private value environment. And um, they, they, they seems to have a difficulty actually to, 
to say uh, to to reject the hypothesis that uh, a particular environment is uh, private values. Um, so, for example, like uh, Philip Heil, I think he has just a recent paper at JPE about the the oil track auctions exactly. So people would think that the oil track auction is. Uh, you would think that, okay, that's no brainer. It should be a common value auction. It should be easily reject the private value kind of a, a hypothesis. But what they find is actually it's not easy. Okay, so you, you really need to take into account um, um, kind of a beta heterogeneity and uh, endogenous entry and so on in order to kind of reject the private values. I imagine that uh, maybe your analysis can speak to that, that why, for example, it seems like kind of a common value setup that uh, if you allow endogenous entry or maybe endogenous information acquisition, maybe um, uh, if you look at the bidding patterns, uh, if, if, if your model assumption is right, then <laughs> indeed what you observe is actually could be uh, consistent with private values. That's one comment. Uh, uh, another kind of question is this. Uh, so I find this result very surprising. Um, so you talk quite a bit about uh, how this result is robust to kind of uh, various uh, relaxation of the assumptions. But I also would like to know that uh, what really will break these results? Yeah. So I would See that, for example, if you relax assumption that uh, your bidders can only acquire uh, one dimension of a uh, components, for example, like if you allow allow them to freely to choose one component or both components to acquire, probably this result may go away. But what if, uh, for example, if, if suppose say that you relax your assumption a bit, say that there's uh, some fixed cost to acquire a second component. Would, would your analysis will still be there if you say that uh, you are there's no fixed cost to acquire the first component, but there's a, some fixed cost to acquire a second component. So the, your assumption will be that the, the, the fixed cost will be infinity, right? So my question is that uh, it's actually would be the case that uh, you maybe do not really need to very need a very high fixed cost to still get your same results. Let me, uh, so thank you for both these points that are, so especially the pointer to the literature in the beginning. On the second point, I fully agree. And this is what drove the analysis the last 15 minutes that I was telling you a bit that I had to rush towards the end, but absolutely. So I am not claiming IPV is robust under every assumption that you can think of. If you even, if there is no private component signal, of course you won't get IPV. If there's any NADA condition, you can't get IPV. So does the second price auction at least do better than another? Now, the way I approached it is by still giving people a one-dimensional signal. And this is for tractability. And I think uh, with what you're suggesting, I was not brave enough to take this literature to the two-dimensional um, so learning in two dimensions. I think if I were able to solve this, that would be a different paper. And uh, there would be several steps on the way to being able to deal with the two dimensional signals before I put this entire level of information choice on it. I, wor I worry about existence with two dimensional signals. We have examples right, right. right mm -hmm. with existence where everything breaks apart. Right. This argument that I was describing to you that, let's assume everybody behaves symmetrically and we are looking at the candidate equilibrium the private component kind of dropped out, right? But this was driven by the fact that you always win with the higher signal. Now in the first and second price auction, if you have two dimensional signals, what does it mean, right? Against which types with the scoring function with two dimensional signals, against whom do you, do you win? And how can we use any of the decision theoretic tools? To, in order to be able to solve this. So I looked into this a couple of years ago briefly and I decided that with two dimensional signals, it's so it's either insolvable, but at least I was not able to get anywhere with this. And I decided um, to even in a general world work with one dimensional signals. But I guess for, at least for me, 
<laughs> if you can give me a numerical example, that would be enough in terms of, I really wanted to see the limit of your result, right? So uh, you can give me, okay, if you, re if you relax in this way, I, 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 don't, I cannot really solve a general model, but okay, here's a numeric example. I can tell you that uh, this will break down. Yes, I do hope that the one dimensional environment that I have in the end, at least, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't say that second price auction will result in IPV. It just says that there's more learning about the common and less about the private and first price versus second price auction. I think it goes a little bit in this direction, but I think for a numerical example, maybe with signals that are almost perfectly revealing, maybe there is a way to go somewhere there. Thank you so much. And also thank you for the suggestion about the, um, the uh, empirical literature. And I think, so what I'm hinting at, change the institution, like from first to second price auction, the nature of IPV or what kind of correlation people have might change endogenously, right? So whether it's in terms of absolute prediction is a different story, but changing an institution might vary the correlation. Right, so mm -hmm. the, the, I think the, 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 the empirical auction literature there, they study, the, I think the, all the option they use in the oil track auction are first price auctions, so, yeah. right. By legal constraints sometimes even, right? Mm -hmm. yep. um, may I ask if, uh, not a, a question about the second part of the analysis? So, mm -hmm. um, so in the second part, when you, when you uh, allow the, the cost of acquiring information, um, how the, uh, so suppose you can, again, let's take the, um, the additive structure, okay? Additive separable structure. Now, if you look at uh, the equilibrium level of information acquisition by the bidders and then compare the social optimal one, do you get uh, uh, the result that they are coin size? So, I wish I had the answer to this. Ask me again to, in two weeks. Um, I have the first thing on my to do list, but I do not the answer yet. Okay, so this is something this, that has very. I, 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 yeah, because I, I this, is, uh, this is kind of related to, for example, the literature on the like information acquisition on efficient mechanisms, like uh, Bergman and Fadi Marki, right? So they have uh, started with uh, these uh, interdependent values and asking about the inf informational efficiency, whether it, it, it is with what is they are kind of uh, consistent with the allocation efficiency or their kind of a uh, conflict or there's a uh, kind of trade-off between allocation efficiency versus uh, allocation efficiency. Absolutely. And I hope that some of their techniques will carry over. Um, I, I will let you know as soon as I figure okay. it out. Okay. Just Good. I don't know the answer yet. It's, it's, it's super interesting. I think the next logical step in this analysis to, to wrap it up. Okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Angel, any comments or questions? Uh, yeah, I'll try to be brief. I mean, I have nothing very deep to say. So, I mean, uh, my first comment is that if I understood correctly your analysis, uh, I mean, the strategic part plays a secondary role, okay, or if anything, no, because as far as I see in your first example, the strategic pack is very trivial, okay, just by looking at the incentives to deviate immediately, you see that there are deviations, okay, and in the second part, you don't even study equilibrium, it's only best responses, right? I mean, yes, kind of, you can, yeah, okay. <laughs> Yes. Okay, I see. Okay, so uh, yeah, I mean, to, to some extent, I wanted to, to understand, I mean, uh, I'm, so how, I mean, because I, I can think of a mechanism in which with only one single player and the price determine correlated, no, a, a posted price, a random posted price, and study how much, uh, you know, the, the buyer can learn information correlated with the price or not correlated with the price. And basically, I guess that we all, I mean, everything you've done, okay, applies in a very direct manner, if I got it right. I'm not sure whether I understand your question correctly. So I fix the behavior of everybody else, but the behavior of everybody else, whether it's second or the first price auction, does make a crucial difference. Of because course, but you can have, mm -hmm. yes, but you, you can have a random price that depends on the canon value, or you can have, ah. I mean, a run, you see. Yeah. Okay, uh, I see. But this then becomes, I think, an interesting, but kind of a metaphysical point. So what any auction we could, that is unobservable to what others are doing, in a way you could probably write, fixing the behavior of everybody else and mimicking it through some kind of other mechanism. Right? I think what you're saying is a flavor of the unobservability of information choice, the fact that information choice is covered, and that you don't know in a way how the others are behaving. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to go deeper. So, but basically, what, what I wanted to understand is at the end of the day, I mean, in all the analysis, looking for a fixed point doesn't play any role. I mean, it's basically trying to understand best responses only. Okay. Yeah. And now the, the second comment is, is more about, I mean, again, I mean, I don't know if it's, uh, I mean, the, the paper is already very interesting and you do a lot of things, no? But uh, I mean, one possible extension that you may consider and, and may have a little bit of interest, okay, is whether you can uh, perhaps cook up an example, which, in which basically you show that, I mean, we know that second price auctions, whenever there is correlation or affiliation, okay, give on average higher expected uh, revenue than first price auctions, okay? But that's only true if there is correlation. If it turns out that you want to acquire information that is not correlated, actually you may get the opposite result, you know, which is kind of an interesting remark, you know what I mean? Absolutely. There was at some point a section on um, linkage principle and surplus in this paper and it got kicked out. And I'm glad that you're bringing this up because it became or it's work in progress on a different um, the, the, the surplus side here. Now, the questions about revenue or the difference in payments in the first and second price auction, um, things are tricky here. So if you think about the classical kind of linkage principle argument, how does it work? People start with a fixed joint distribution of signals. And on top of this, you do something like you disclose information or you pick a different auction door, right? But the initial distribution of private signal, that one is fixed. Now that one is varying in my environment. And this gives quite interesting results about non-monotonicity of the payoff based on what the people are learning about. So, uh, yeah, let me reiterate my point from the end. Super interesting question outside of that paper, but something that I am working on um, with respect to what it means for the total pie, depending on, because if bidders learn about the common component, they're shrinking the pie. There's only the expected value of the common component plus their expected value of the private to extract from, right? On the other hand, if they learn about the private component, we are decreasing correlation, so you might think maybe that's not good for surplus or maybe that's not good for kind of extraction, but our total surplus increases, right? Potentially we can hope for the second highest expected value of them all. So there's this non-trivial force between the two that would require a serious uh, like revenue paper and not the efficiency paper that I've presented today to give it, I think, the full attention it deserves. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Constantine. Uh, hi, yeah. Uh, again, I see I want to follow up on one of my questions I was asking like in the middle of the talk. So imagine uh, that uh, I'm not choosing one or the other, but I can uh, choose both at the same time. So I'm getting some imprecise signal about private component and some imprecise signal about public component. And then effectively I end up with like two signals and maybe maybe I can choose how, how accurate are they, but I receive two of them. Uh, is it uh, completely impossible from technical perspective or maybe do you see some chance there? So with the two dimensional signals? Yes. I do not know. And I think the amount of assumptions that you would have to impose to get existence to get well-behaved properties. I'm not sure that I would be comfortable with, with doing that. I think if you can solve this with information choice, there are a couple of steps along the way that need to be understood before putting the layer of information choice about components on there. And even a one-dimensional, I, I, let me say, I do not know, I would be thrilled to see this work out. I was not brave enough to go there myself because I couldn't basically live with all these assumptions that I would have to be imposing for, uh, things to make sense and not be not to not be describing an empty set in a way. And I think that also connects to Angel's question. So I, I do not know, do the fixed point analysis here because I'm basically building on the seminal work of Milgram and Weber and Athi who have done the work in this environment with one dimensional signals that I'm building on. So I can basically use their results to not worry about a couple of issues in this environment. Two dimensional signals, I wish I had more, <laughs> I do not. Okay, a uh, simpler, simpler thing then. Uh, so, as far as I understood, your like informational comparison it builds up on affiliation, right? So uh, everything has to be affiliated, and then it works. Uh, kind of personally, I don't like affiliation. Like, kind of, can we can we live without it somehow? 
we could assume that the objects that need to be increasing in your signal are increasing, right? So, but, it, uh, but, it's, that, but it's way weaker than affiliation, no? Just directly assuming that. Yeah, I mean, I'm not claiming definitely or something like this. It's without, it's with loss, certainly, with two bidders to be talking about this. What kind of notion of, of positive correlation that is weaker? And I mean, there are several. Would you be more comfortable? What do you think? What do, you, do you have a particular one in mind? No, I'm kind of working. I'm working on that myself. But I was thinking, I was saying that just the monotonicity properties that you are really using are way weaker than assuming that everything is affiliated. So you need you need kind of way less than the actual affiliation because kind of affiliation is very strong. It's good for normal distributions, right? When you have this like mixed der cross derivative of a logarithm for free. Right, but if it's not normal, then it's it becomes very problematic very quickly. Well, this is an excellent suggestion. I have not thought about this. Um, this is okay, a commonly, just, assumed, just, I mean, just, as you know, yeah. commonly assumed in the auction literature. But I could think about which <laughs> objects need to be going in the right direction and then assume it directly on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me think about that. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, thank you very much. We don't have much time for extra questions in the Zoom, but uh, so we want to invite everyone to go to the